Hi everyone, I'm Noor Bashara from Upcycle Design School and I'm really excited about this month's workshop. We have Tara St. James from Resourced and I met Tara in um, back when I was at the BFDA and she was one of my mentors there and she ran the production lab and um, had the sustainable fabric library. So um, thank you, Tara, so much for uh, being our workshop host this month and I'll let you get started. Thanks, Noor. Um, it's great to meet everybody. Nice to see where you're all coming in from or dialing in from. Um, as Noor mentioned, if you have questions while I'm talking, please don't uh, feel like you have to wait until the end, I have a, a presentation that I prepared uh, to give you some visual context to, oh, to what I do um, because it's, I think, a lot more fun than just looking at me talking for, for the next hour. Um, but if you do have questions about the specific slide that I'm sharing or something that I happen to say, please feel free to reach out to me um, either by unmuting yourself and asking a question or by dropping it in the chat box. I'll try to keep an eye on that um, while I'm presenting, if I can. Um, and then also, if you have questions at the end, of course, we'll have a, a Q&A to talk about everything. So I'm going to start sharing my screen because uh, my presentation will also give you some background to where I'm coming from uh, and, and what brought me to the work that I'm currently doing. So you should be able to all see this. I've had some trouble moving slides with this version of Acrobat before. So let me know if you don't see it when I move slides. Um, here we go. Okay, so my name is Tara St. James, as Norm mentioned. We met when I was at the Brooklyn Fashion and Design Accelerator where I was uh, managing the cut and sew side of the production facility and also running a sustainable uh, textile space there. Um, this is where I got my start in the fashion industry. So I was born and raised in Montreal, where I also studied uh, fashion design. My degree is in tailoring, so in menswear, which I think has informed a lot of my aesthetic decisions since then. Um, um, yeah. Sorry to interrupt. Are you moving slides right now? Yes, you're not seeing. You're not, not seeing it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's what I thought. For some reason, this version of Acrobat doesn't move slides, so I will just keep it like this. Because um, when I go into full screen, it doesn't. So now, do you see the next slide? Yes. All right. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. Um, you'll just have to get a see the the dashboard and everything. All right. So this is my first collection that I designed when I was five, uh, which. I, I, like I said, I have a background in fashion design, um, but have since worked in, in production and sourcing uh, in, in, for most of my career. But my collection here looks a lot like the collections that I still produce to this day, which I think is quite funny. And one day I hope to go back to this collection and, and produce it as is. Um, so this is a little bit of the timeline that I experienced uh, through my career. Not everything, of course, but I'll start in 2004, uh, which is several years after I graduated from, co uh, from college, uh, with a brand called Covet, which was really my first foray into sustainability and, and how I, I started researching. Um, and as you can maybe imagine, 2004 was a difficult time for understanding sustainability strategy in the fashion industry because there wasn't very much information. Now I think we're on the other end of that timeline, which uh, is, is sort of like an overabundance of information and a difficulty to understand and, and uh, disseminate what goes where. So that's essentially the work that I'm doing. But back in 2004, while I was sourcing and producing for Covet, I started to see the difference between, or to research the difference between conventional cotton and organic cotton. And that was really uh, what opened my eyes to environmental problems in the fashion industry. Uh, workforce and labor and waste issues came much later. 
but that was my, my start in environmental problems. So I started converting the supply chain for that brand over to a more so, um, ethically responsible and socially responsible supply chain uh, while we were producing in India and China. In 2009, I started SETI New York with the goal to produce domestically in New York City, uh, where I was living. So I mentioned that I was born and raised in Montreal, but I lived for most of my life in New York and only just recently, uh, as of last November, moved back to Montreal to be closer to family during this wonderful time of pandemic that we're in. Um, but in 2009, I started Study New York with the goal of continuing my work in sustainability through zero waste pattern making, which is uh, a personal passion of mine, uh, responsible materials and local production in New York City. At the same time, around that time, I started teaching at FIT. And I still teach a class in the sustainability certificate there on sustainable textile sourcing. Um, so that's understanding new innovation in textiles and material development in the world of fashion. Um, primarily fashion, actually. Um, I do touch on some materials for accessories, but it's really for apparel. Uh, and then continued to do that work through the Brooklyn Fashion and Design Accelerator, which is where I met Noor. And that's where I was production manager and built a sustainable textile library, which led me to uh, developing the study resource library, which I have now rebranded as resourced uh, as an independent consultancy. And that's essentially what I'm going to talk to you about today. But I did want to give you a little bit more background into uh, my personal development, just so that you get a sense of what my uh, goals are with reg regards to sustainability. Um, so this is a framework that I use for teaching in my class, and I can put a link um, in the chat box later on, because the, the little link in the bottom here is not hyperlinked, um, and so you're not going to be able to click on it, but I, I'll put it in the chat box and, and then send it out to, to Nora so she can share it with the, uh, with the video of this recording. But this is essentially a group of design strategies that were developed almost 20 years ago by um, the London College of, of Design and then uh, eventually by an organization called Mistra Future Fashion in Sweden. Uh, and they were done as a partnership. And this is what I use as a baseline for sustainability strategies. And it essentially encompasses pretty much everything, although some of them need to be broken down and added to. Um, the ones that I focus on are the first one, designed to minimize waste, uh, the seventh, designed for ethical production, um, and then the eighth, designed to, re to reduce the need to consume. And there's a lot of things that fall under those categories, but those are the core ones for my personal brand. And I think what's really important is to understand all of them and how they impact uh, the world and the industry itself. And then to choose two or three that are really important for you because trying to do all of these is virtually impossible. And I see a lot of brands that I work with as clients attempt to tackle all of this, especially as they're just starting out, and then ultimately become overwhelmed with the idea of trying to do everything. And some of them actually conflict with one another. Um, and I can go into that a little bit more in depth, but I, I think it's, it's important to just really strategize on the few that are important and then go deep into those. Doesn't mean you can't add more later, um, but certainly start with the ones that are most important to you. And so this is why design to reduce waste is super important to me. So I presume most of you will recognize what this is. It's a pattern marker for a larger, um, more industrial size production run. But uh, if you don't understand, I'm happy to break it down for you. So just either put your hand up or, or mention. Um, but the 15% you see at the bottom is what's considered tech um, industry waste on a global scale uh, as an average. So 15% is what we would consider in the industry to be an efficient pattern marker. So 15% means 15% of the fabric is wasted during the cutting process. So that's all the little white bits that you see in between the, the colored pattern pieces. Uh, and actually this pattern itself, I know it's a little bit blurry, but this pattern has a 87 point uh, 87.12, I think, percent efficiency rate. So it means that there's less than 13% that's being wasted, which is still quite considerable. But if you think of the 
millions of, and actually billions of garments that are being produced every year and calculate 15% of that, you can imagine that that's a lot of textile waste. And the reality is that it's closer to 35 to 50% of textile waste that goes to landfill or to dead stock every year because we're not just talking about these little white bits of waste that are cut, cutting room floor scraps, but we're also talking about the end of the roll that maybe wasn't used, the extra roll that was over-purchased, the fabric that was canceled because the color didn't match the exact color of that season, uh, the mill that went out of business. So there's a lot of textile waste that is not accounted for in this production marker. And that is what I wanted to defeat. So one by zero waste pattern making, which says, this is my first foray into zero waste pattern making with my first collection, spring 2010. Um, and it was a zero waste pattern that was meant to be convertible. Um, so you could design to replace the need to consume using dead stock material. So most of that collection was produced using uh, leftover wasted materials or uh, certified organic traceable materials. Those were the two approaches to textile sourcing that I was adopting for my own work. Uh, so this one, I will show you the pattern. It's what's on the right here. Uh, the yield cover of the book on the left is the uh, book that accompanied a presentation of these zero waste patterns that toured um, to a couple different museums around the world. So this, th that piece that I showed uh, was part of an installation on zero waste patterns back in, I wanna say 2012, but I don't really remember the year. Um, but the pattern was for the collection in 2010. And so I, my approach to zero waste patterns is relatively lazy. It's really just squares and, and rectangles that I then put together with pleats and buttons so that it's convertible and, and can be um, modular, but also quite simple. So another example of zero waste patterns that I think is a lot more complex um, is this one from Holly McQuillan, who actually just recently completed her PhD on the subject in Sweden. Uh, and this particular pattern is from the book called Zero Waste Patterns that was written by herself and by Timo Riesenen, who was a professor at Parsons on Zero Waste Patterns and has now moved to uh, Australia to do the same. And this is one of his patterns. So you can see they're much more complex, which is why I, I term my own approach as quite lazy. Um, because what you see on the right here is uh, equivalent of the hoodie on the left. And then in here, there are multiple styles, as you can probably tell by the name. So you have uh, a dress. In the center, you have a dress, you have a vest, um, you have a pant. On the left, you have a t-shirt, a hoodie. I think that's it on, the, on that side. And then on the right, you have a, uh, a pant and a, and a top. And I'll pause here for a second, just in case anybody has any questions. But I actually have a question for you too, in case you feel free um, to share your opinion. Can anyone think of any problems uh, with scaling zero waste to the, the industry at large? And don't be shy, there are no real wrong answers here. Nobody? Well, I'll give, I'll give you a hint. It has to do with sizing. So, does somebody want to share? Yeah, I think the chemicals used in uh, processing the stuff, um, like uh, the, the pesticides used to uh, supplement uh, the growth of cotton, um, in terms of the uh, short plants. There are cotton trees, but they're more difficult to harvest. So, and they also save a lot of water. So okay. there's a lot of water. Anyway. Uh, yeah, I, I don't disagree with your perspective, but this, these aren't necessarily always cotton. These could be made out of any fabric. For me, it's yeah. fabric industry, but it's just kind of like we always do things a certain way. So like the plants that we own, they're used to cutting all the smalls together and the mediums together. For me, in one of my earlier trips, trying to get them to mix sizes in the marker was yeah. kind of a challenge. So it's just kind of thinking differently, I think yeah. is a challenge in a large scale manufacturing. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, and and like I mentioned, the other issue would be around sizing. So um, what you have to do with zero waste is a, diff a different approach to pattern making than say uh, your typical pattern where you'd start with the design of the garment and then create a pattern according to that and then um, produce it. In this case, you're actually starting with the fabric itself, the pattern and the design all at the same time because the fabric is integral to the pattern because you need the width of the fabric and not all fabrics are the same width, although there might be some similarities from one to the other, um, but your pattern has to completely change if you change your fabric. And so you have to keep that in account. Um, and as you can see with this one, this is for one size hoodie, but if you need to scale it up or scale it down to a different size, it gets quite complicated um, to, to create another pattern accordingly. So sometimes, and at the BFDA, we played around with this a little bit um, for one, one or two of our clients who wanted zero waste pattern, uh, you, you neither, it, you either need to develop all sizes at the same time so that they're, you're creating all the patterns at once, um, or you just make a one size fits all garment, which was my approach to it. But again, I think that's the, I'll call it the lazy solution because it was my approach. Um, so anyway, that's that's one one way of approaching it. Another way of approaching minimizing waste would be this one, which was uh, to take a garment that I was already producing, which was the dress dress on the left, and take back the waste from the manufacturer. And I'll be honest, when I got the waste back from the manufacturer was not all nicely balled up into rolls like this. That was something that we did in in studio. Um, with my wonderful gang of interns who, who would take the, the waste itself, cut it up into these one inch strips and then uh, connect those strips to make what was essentially a, a yarn, a very thick yarn. And with that yarn, we worked with Weaving Hand in Brooklyn who are um, an organization, a nonprofit or organization of weavers who then took the yarn and wove it into a new textile. Uh, and then the width here could be specified. So in fact, we produced two different widths of this fabric that were um, only two inch difference, but essentially that was the, graded, the grade rule. Um, and we made these sweatshirts out of it. Um, and the sweatshirt itself had a zero waste pattern because it was fairly simple. Um, and, and so the two garments combined created this almost zero waste mini collection. But um, again, very complicated because each of these sweatshirts was one of a kind depending on, on the dress. Uh, but that is, I think, the luxury of having a small brand and being malleable and being able to pivot and not working with these large textile or manufacturing organizations that have very strict ways of approaching production for efficiency sake. Um, and then this is something else that I think is important that um, is something that I work with clients through resource on very carefully. Uh, through study in 2016, we changed our main label through a rebranding process and included not just the size and care and content, but also the fiber origin. So where the fiber came from, if we knew that information, because it's quite difficult, uh, the name and the location of the fabric mill, uh, the name and the location of the sewing factory, and then finally the signature of the person who sewed the clothes um, so that we could reconnect the name of the person sewing the clothes with the customer who ultimately was going to wear it. Um, because I thought that that connection had been lost in the industry. Uh, through fast fashion and uh, opacity in, in the supply chain. And I wanted to, to reconnect to those two. Um, so this is currently what the main label looks like for, for all study garments. Um, but one of the biggest problems that I saw while I was working in industry, as well as even on my own, is that the fashion industry works in, op operates in isolation uh, and you can't solve problems when you're in a silo. So it is really important um, to, to make change through collaboration. And the other thing that started becoming more and more prevalent in, well, this is 2018, but still relevant today is that consumers and journalists are paying attention. So if you need a reason to be more sustainable and ethical, although I'm presuming that none of you on this call do need that reason because you're spending your time trying to learn more and kudos to you for that. Um, but a lot of these bigger brands do need that reason and that reason can be financial, can be ethical. 
um, but people are paying attention. So that is why I launched Resource to facilitate collaboration between key players in the industry. Um, this is an example of collaboration that I think is particularly poignant. Um, this is an email that I have permission to share from the production manager at Mara Hoffman, who back in 2016 was looking to replace their traditional poly bags with uh, uh, a bioplastics option, a compostable one uh, from a company called Tifa in Israel. And so they um, couldn't reach the, the, the minimums from the factory to produce the bags. So they reached out to a network of designers who potentially would be also interested. And they offered a couple different bag sizes. And as a result, Tifa, the company also offered to print uh, different logos on the one bag order so that the different customers amongst the group could um, could have their, their branded bags, even though they were all part of the same order in order to reach the, the factory minimums. This ordinarily didn't, it sounds pretty straightforward and obvious, but doesn't happen in the fashion industry, especially among higher end Hi. brands, because you're trying to sh keep your supply chain. Hi. Hello? Oh, sorry. Okay. That was an accidental <laughs> unmute by my daughter. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so this to me is, uh, is an, a great example of the potential for collaboration in the industry um, and how we can share resources and suppliers. And that's what I want to do with resource. Another great example of collaboration in the industry is the Adidas Allbirds um, attempt to make the world's most sustainable shoe. If you haven't looked up this collaboration, it's a good one. And I think, I believe, although I don't know for a fact, is a result of the Allbirds call out of the Amazon shoe that was essentially a copy of their product uh, without a copy of the supply chain. So for those of you who don't know Allbirds, it's a, um, it's a, well, started out as a wool shoe uh, with a transparent supply chain from New Zealand uh, using merino wool. They're super comfortable. I have a pair, I love them. Uh, the sole of the shoe is made from a bioplastic made from sugarcane. Um, so there is no plastic except for the laces, I believe are recycled polyester, but those can be removed and recycled. Uh, and so Amazon made a copy of their shoe, but didn't copy the supply chain. and. Allbirds retaliated with a call out um, saying, you know, we don't mind if you copy our shoe, but at least copy the sustainability initiatives that are embedded into our shoe, not just the aesthetic, because that's why people are buying it. Um, and I think Adidas approached them, or maybe they approached Adidas with the idea of collaborating on the supply chain for the shoe using an Adidas aesthetic, uh, which I think is super interesting. Anyway, this leads me to the wide, vast world of textile sourcing and understanding materials in the textile world. So um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the sustainable angle, it is a sustainable material library and um, sourcing event show, trade show, usually in normal times um, in London. And they put out a guidebook for their members and their subscribers. and. Um, this is what they use as a materials matrix that uh, I think is very comprehensive, although it is missing some things. But if you remember those 10 strategies from TED's 10 that I shared earlier, this is sort of parallel to that where it allows you to uh, really feed into certain parts of the matrix. Um, what's not really included on here, but is sort of encompassed on all of this is overstock or dead stock uh, materials. So you could potentially put them in the recycled area down here because they're essentially reused or recycled. But at the end of the day, it's important to know what that material is in, in that you're using so that you can figure out what to do with it at the end of its life. And that's why we want to use, we, we want to know the, the, the origin source of our materials for two reasons. One is to understand what we're using and try to figure out the supply chain of where it came from, how it was grown or raised, how, um, and then how it can be treated. So how our customers should wear it, how long it'll last, uh, how to wash it or clean it or take care of it. And then 
Thirdly, what to do, so I lied, there wasn't two, there's three. Thirdly, what to do with it at the end of its life. So can it be recycled? Can it be reused? Um, can it be composted? Even though I think that one's a little bit tricky. Um, so what do we do with it when we're done with it? And so this is part of the matrix that I help customers understand. So I'm gonna give you some examples of what's happening in industry using that matrix and what kind of connections that I make uh, using resource. So the first is Four Days T-shirts. If you haven't heard of this company, they're based out of California. It's like a subscription service kind of um, for T-shirts and sweatshirts and basics where you, you join as a member and you buy your T-shirts. And then instead of becoming a repurchaser, you send back the T-shirt when you no longer want it. And then you get a new one in return for much less expensive um, and they recycle the t-shirt that you sent back and the way they can do this is by knowing the uh, content of that original t-shirt which was a very high quality long stable organic cotton that can then be recycled um, into a new fiber using a blend of that organic cotton fiber and some of the recycled um, some of the recycled content um, which they are recycling into their own supply chain so they don't take back other clothes. Well, they do take back other clothes from other uh, brands, but they won't recycle it into their collection. Um, and one of the suppliers that they're working with is called Returnity. Um, and they're, it's, this is more for packaging. It's not for the production itself, but I think packaging is actually a really easy way to start to dip your toe into sustainability, especially for a bigger brand. It's sort of low hanging fruit because um, because one, it doesn't affect the product. So it's not disrupting your supply chain at all if you already have that in place. And two, it's the first thing that your customer sees when they get the product, especially now that most of our products are sold through e-commerce. Uh, the packaging represents really the ESO ethos and aesthetic of the brand. So um, Returnity is a recycled nylon reusable packaging that be can be reused over 50 times. Uh, and so if you have ever worked with Rent the Runway, for example, they use this company uh, as does four days. So it's like a, a zip pouch that can be sealed by the customer to send back any clothing that they want recycled um, and then get the new, new garments in exchange. Um, another example of who's doing what in sustainability is Eileen Fisher's Waste No More. I'm not going to go into detail about this project because I'm sure you have all seen it um, extensively and understand. If you don't, I definitely recommend going by the Brooklyn, the Carroll Gardens store because they have a great display uh, on this process and what they're doing. One of the suppliers that they work with is called Feltloom. Uh, they actually own one of these machines, but um, work with other suppliers who have them as well. And what you can do with this that I think is really cool is put in textile waste of most quality. So it depends on what the material is. Again, another reason why it's important to know what's in your textiles. Um, and you can put them through and it felts them together. So if anyone's done needle felting before, this is basically a large scale machine that does needle felting. So um, just in front of her fingers on the picture, there are thousands of needles that are lined up. So it's like a big knitting machine, but with needles. And it's safe because there are guardrails that maybe you can't see, but um, so the needles uh, punch through the fabrics. And in her case, in the example, it looks like there's only one fiber that's being felted, but you can put multiple layers. And that's how Eileen Fisher is felting together fabric for bags and coats and, and sweaters and other things like that. So pretty cool. Um, although maybe a little bit noisy to have in, in your home, um, but very cool to, to have access to. And I wish more factories had these in-house so that they could recycle some of the textile waste from that 15% I mentioned earlier. Kara, can I interrupt you for a second? Please, please. Do you know of a of a resource if designers want to have access to felting machines and want to experiment that with that on their own? Um, yeah, you mean not on their own through purchasing of a of a felting machine? You mean? Yes, yes, through just. There are a few people that I contacted in New York State region who have them, so I would recommend reaching out to Feltloom directly as a company and asking them that question, asking them if there's anyone in your area 
uh, who has one who who either rents it out if they if you want to play with it, but more likely because it does require a certain level of training to use it, more likely it would be a collaboration between the designer who has the textile waste and then the person who owns the felt loom. Um, but they're it's a small family owned company um, and so they're really nice to work with. So I would definitely recommend um, I would definitely recommend reaching out to them and, and talking to them about. Uh, who in your area has has access to this? Okay, great. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Um, another example of a great brand collaboration is Industry of All Nations, which is a brand out of California. They just opened a shop in New York, although that was last year. So I'm not. I'm hoping it's still open, but I'm not 100% sure on that one. Uh, they work really closely with the New Denim Project out of Guatemala, which is one of my favorite suppliers um, who I was lucky enough to, to visit a couple of years ago. And they are a um, third generation textile mill that recycles denim scraps, which you see on the left here, into new materials. Uh, using no dyes or chemicals because they keep the color of the denim. So that blue color. So all their fabrics are essentially light blue um, or natural because they also recycle uh, their own internal cotton waste. One of the problems here is that they're using conventional cotton to blend with the uh, recycled cotton because they don't have the the buying power to to buy organic cotton to blend in and there's uh, a minimal supply of it in Guatemala. So they're trying to change that, but right now they're, they do have to use some amount of conventional cotton, um, but there's still no dyeing in the process because they're using the, the blue dye from the original denim waste uh, from a local jean supplier. Um, and they can even dye, oh, and this is, uh, sorry, they can even use a small amount of spandex. And I didn't mention this in the felt loom, but one of the reasons we can't recycle a lot of our materials today is because they contain spandex and spandex uh, will damage a, a, uh, a textile recycling facility because it breaks the machines. Uh, if it's a small amount of spandex, it's okay because it can go undetected. But for most products uh, in active wear, it's upward of 20% spandex, which can be very, very problematic. Um, and so that's why spandex is, is certainly needs to be addressed as, a, as an issue. And there is recycled spandex, recyclable spandex, biodegradable spandex from natural sources now available on the market, but still very small scale. So um, New Denim Project is, is mainly using rigid denim, which is, means no stretch. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry about that. Um, New Denim Project is using uh, no spandex or a very, very small amount of spandex. Uh, okay, so next one is Lebenskleidung out of Germany, and they are a textile supplier that are not producing in Germany. They produce uh, primarily in India. They do have a new supply chain in Africa, uh, as well as in Italy and a few other places in, in Europe. So depending on what you're producing, they focus on transparent, um, uh, visible supply chains for primarily organic cotton, but they also have recycled wool, which you can see in the picture on the, the, the tweet on the bottom left. Uh, as well as a few other materials. They're also now doing an on-demand print service. So they'll print one yard uh, using a digital printing technique that uh, uses no water and, and is very minimal as far as uh, MOQs. So I like them, but to be honest with you, shipping from Germany can be quite difficult and expensive. So they're very, very much focused on developing in the European market. If you're producing in Europe, great. Producing in the United States can be a little bit expensive. Um, if you're producing in India, you can always uh, work with them to keep the materials there uh, and, and ship from the mill directly to your facility. That's one way to do it. And that's why it's important to understand where things are coming from so that you can plug it into your supply chain rather than shipping things all over the world. So that's another one that I think uh, is doing a really good job. Uh, Miram, for those of you who produce accessories like footwear, bags, 
uh, is a plant-based alternative to leather. I don't love this picture because it's hard to tell what it is, but they are looking at disrupting the PVC and PU markets. So the vegan leather alternatives that are out there, which are primarily plastic. Um, so this is a biodegradable and recyclable product that only uses vegetable oils and hemp and coconut husks and other, other materials. And they're made in the United States, so it's entirely produced in Illinois, which I think is fantastic. Um, and then this one, based out of the UK, is uh, an alternative to sequins, which I think is great because for those of you who make evening wear or anything fancy, sequins are made of plastic, as you probably all know. Very few of them are made of metals. Um, so there, I have worked with some sequins in India that are made of uh, punched metal, but most are made of actual plastics. So um, they are using recycled plastics for the first iteration and then uh, are also launching a biodegradable uh, line of, of pla uh, non-plastic uh, sequins in the future. They're working on that now. Um, so Carolina, I see your question of recycled metal trims and notions. Yes, I actually have a supplier in, um, I believe they're in Westchester, if I'm not mistaken. And I will, while we're chatting, uh, dig up their name for you because they are a great supplier of, and they use recycled metal in their, in their production. And then there are a few in Europe as well, but um, I, I like to start with American suppliers first and then move on from there. All right, and one of my new favorites is again for packaging. I know the bag is a plastic bag, uh, but they're also focused on making poly bag alternatives. And this is a water soluble material uh, with plant starch and polyvinyl alcohol that you put in your well, bathtub or your sink and pour hot water on it and it'll degrade entirely um, and not leave any microplastics or other chemicals in the water stream. So it is marine safe. Um, and they're making not just uh, bags like you see here, but also mailers and clear poly bags uh, and other things. So I think this is a really exciting alternative to like the TIPA bag that I mentioned earlier uh, or recycled plastic poly bags. If you have to use a poly bag, I think it's important to do some research on which one is best for you. My personal issue with the biodegradable poly bags is that most customers don't have access to a industrial grade compost facility near them, especially now that the pandemic is, has, has hit. Most of the cities have cut their compost facilities and compost pickups. I know New York did that before I left. Um, even Montreal isn't picking up their compost um, and it's supposed to be a zero waste city soon. So um, letting the consumer take ownership of what to do with this product without giving them a large uh, burden of, of taking care of it, I think is really important and pretty cool thing to like put a bag in your sink and watch it disappear. Um, if any of you who have ordered the, the um, water soluble packing peanuts, those it's a very similar process. Um, I think that Lush uses those. My brother's obsessed with Lush, so I know a lot more than I would usually know about them. Um, but there are a few companies out there uh, working with, with uh, water-soluble packaging. And let's see. Oh, this one I'm gonna skip over because they just closed down last month, which I'm really sad about, but I'll talk about it briefly because they are hoping to get more funding and uh, reopen in a different location. Um, but On Point Manufacturing was a, an on-demand manufacturing facility um, and they were making one product at a time, which I think is really, really innovative. Um, but obviously, they, and they didn't close down because they weren't getting enough traction or, or making enough money. It was actually because it was a family owned business and there was some, some family drama um, with the funding. So that's a little side note for you. But uh, on-demand manufacturing is basically, they were producing a product uh, through a typical cut and sew supply chain, but making one at a time. And they had a lot of the process automated with machinery so that it could be more efficient. But at the end of the day, they were still working with sewers who were processing the products. Uh, and I think that's really cool. 
Um, so I will leave you with this and my contact information. And if you want, you can just grab a screen screenshot of that, but I will also put it in the, in the chat box. And then we can talk and I'm gonna start looking for that metal, that metal supplier for you, Carolina, while we're talking. So if anyone has any questions, hopefully um, I can solve some of them for you while you have me here. And so essentially with resource, what the way I work with my clients is um, I'll talk to them about what their future designs are or current supply chain. And a lot of my customers are new designers who are starting to launch a brand or who uh, have worked in the industry for a while, but now want to, to leave and do something new. And, um, and so I help them first understand what their sustainability strategy is through the TEDS 10 and then some other initiatives like the UN Sustainability Goals uh, and a few other certification parameters. Uh, so we establish what their strategies are if they don't already have them and then work towards finding suitable materials for their supply chain, whether that's domestic in the United States or overseas or wherever it is. Um, yes, I'll put my email here and that's also the website. So if you wanna go poke around at it, we also have a monthly textile Tuesday series. So if you wanna meet some of the suppliers uh, every month, we have them come and present. That, no, it's just resource.fashion, that's all. Um, no fancy.com. So um, yeah, so they come and present and they do like a similar to this, presentation, but they'll do a presentation on their materials, on their supply chain, where the company came from, how they operate. And then I invite the listeners to ask questions about supply chain and ask about transparency and, and really get to the, the um, nitty gritty of where they're at. Um, I'm going to do some little digging on the metal trims while I'm talking, um, but does anyone have any questions or wanna share a particular challenge that they're having um, with, with sourcing or with fabrics, anything like that? Nobody's having problems with fabric. So I actually had a question that was emailed to me this week um, by May from Four Objects. I don't think that she's here with us today, but she um, is looking for organic cotton ponte, organic cotton um, wool ponte, and organic cotton indigo chambray selvage like a shirt fabric mm -hmm. and then she's wondering if there's a conversation to be had about bone and horn and she's looking for a supplier of buttons that's getting their raw materials from traceable non-feedlot sources Oof, a lot of different yeah, that's a lot <laughs> um and i actually know her she was in my class at fit a couple of years ago oh yes yes yeah. she mentioned that yeah yeah um okay those are all the good questions but really very particular to her supply chain, but there is uh, one mill that I didn't mention. Um, and I'll put all the links as we're talking just so that you have them um, that might be able to do the shirting and the, the traceable, um, was, sorry, was it organic cotton shirting and what? It was, sorry, one second. Uh, I have a lot of windows. So, um, I really like this company, Houston Textile out in Northern California. They only source fiber and um, spun yarn from US grown certified organic sources. They use uh, climate beneficial wool from Fiber Shed in California. They also use certified organic textile or cotton from I believe North Carolina and they have a woven uh, old vintage woven uh, weaving looms that they use that they've refurbished, which I think are really great. And they have a line of uh, denim shirting. They also are doing some, some salvage denim. So that might be a good solution there. I also really like Organic Cotton Plus, uh, as well as Hemp Traders. Those are both really available. Uh, they will give you the supply chain if you ask them. It's not always written on the, the product information, but you can reach out to them and ask them. Um, a lot of their cotton is either US grown or uh, Indian. 
um, for Organic Cotton Plus, but they have a wide variety of different qualities of materials. Um, hemp Traders is mostly Chinese hemp, uh, but I really like some of the products. Actually, another maybe better solution there, if anyone's looking for hemp, is um, uh, Hemp Fortex out of China, which is one of the largest suppliers of hemp textiles, used to be really difficult to work with because their minimums were 3,000 to 5,000 yards per, per quality. Uh, but they've just opened a small um, orders for available, um, av available products. Um, called Bestine, and I'll put the link here. Um, I was really excited to see that they opened this, and I'm guessing it's a response to uh, customers wanting smaller product uh, availability. Anybody else have any images or, or products that they're looking for? Uh, I was curious. I'm looking into doing some plus size um, stuff. So do you have any uh, strategies to consider when you're sourcing for plus size? Because I mean, I know that the kind of material that is gonna be, tend to be more um, useful in plus size is stretchy. Mm -hmm. So like trying to keep that sustainable or as low of a footprint as possible. Yeah, well, stretchy, I mean, you also want something to consider when sourcing is you also want your product to be durable and long lasting, right? And sometimes stretch is the only solution to that. With active wear, with certain intimates, um, if you don't include stretch, then the product is just gonna fall apart more quickly and that's not sustainable either. So you also wanna take that into account. Uh, with a majority of um, plus size though, you can use, you can use a chem or not a chemical, you can use a mechanical stretch in the fabric. So you don't have to add spandex or lycra. You can get either a knit fabric that has a natural stretch to it, or there are a lot of wovens now that have what's called a, uh, why do I keep saying chemical? That have a mechanical stretch, um, is which is just the way it's woven, but it has a little bit of stretch. So it'll be the equivalent of like two, 3% spandex, not more than that. Um, if you're looking at heavy spend, at, you know, heavy stretch, like eight, ten percent, or even more, that's really hard to achieve with the with the weaving process. But if you're looking for just like a little bit of comfort stretch, I would ask suppliers for for that first before reverting to to anything with spandex. But other well, than that, you. I think that's the only limitations. Yeah. Um, all right, so Gabby, great question. Um, you already know of Queen of Rot and Fab Scrap and Vintage Fabric, those are good. Yes, I have one more for you. It's a relatively new equivalent, um, actually based out of Montreal. And I'm always happy to give some Canadian companies um, a little plug, but it's um, similar to uh, Queen of Ra, but it's called Tenjiva. Um, also, hi, Gabby. <laughs> Good to see you. Um, I, I like them. They're not just uh, dead stock from brands, but also directly from the mills. So any overstock that they've produced, uh, they're selling it directly. So you often have lower quantities available, but um, a lot more diversity in the materials. And it's a growing site, so they, they may be relatively new, but I think they're gonna grow quite quickly and have access to a lot more mills around the world. Um, that, I think that's the best, the best option I can give you outside of the ones that you already have. And I think Nadine has her hand raised. Yes. Oh, sorry, yes. Nadine, I didn't see no that. Problem. Hi, Noor. Hi, uh, Tara. Very, very interesting uh, webinar. Um, I'm based in Beirut in Lebanon, uh, and we're mainly here have access to uh, dead stock fabric. The thing is, uh, within the span of a year, our currency lost 80% of its value. So it's even more difficult to import fabric, organic fabric, sustainable fabrics. Mm -hmm. uh, my question to you, Tara, is where can I find other, you know, potential solutions such as felt looms that you mentioned, so that we have, you know, ways to uh, recycle the waste and, you know, create more value with what we already have? 
Great question. And I'm, I'm very saddened by events in, in Lebanon. So my heart goes out to yeah. you, but I'm, Thank you. Yeah, I do see a lot of innovation happening. Um, I'll give you a bit of a parallel. So I work really closely with a company in Havana and Cuba who uh, yeah. have always had supply chain issues or at least the last 50 or 60 years or so. So, um, and have, they've innovated by, uh, and the company is um, called Clandestina. And I talk about them a lot on, on social media um, because I think they're really innovating when it comes to supply chain, which they have very little of. So they've created their own workshop uh, and trained sewers to do certain types of products, very basic, but still uh, wonderful. And then um, are using a, as a resource, all of the clothing donations that flood into developing countries, primarily in Latin America, um, to take them apart and re recycle them, upcycle them into new products. Some of them, they're just basically sort of like recutting them and printing over them, like t-shirts and, yeah. and hoodies and stuff, which is more conventional upcycling. Others, they're completely cutting apart and reweaving in a similar way to uh, what I showed you with the, the sweatshirt that we were weaving um, with weaving hands. So like two very, very, very extreme solutions. As far as the felt loom type thing, I don't know where to direct you regionally. That can be yeah. done manually, but it takes a lot of lot of labor. Um, I'm I'm think I'm looking for you know a bigger uh, a large scale scale solution for more like a B2B application more mm -hmm. than you know B2C you know like resewing garments etc. Ah, okay. So really trying to come up with uh, let's say more innovative solution that could benefit you know different uh, different uh, users whether it's uh, let's say fabric for furniture or or clothing but really filling this gap of uh, you know textile variety a sustainable solution that is you know done locally so you want to actually become that b2b solution Yes, um, I want to ah. develop something like that because we have a lot of, uh, I mean, we have a waste issue that has been going on for a few years, but uh, now it's really, I mean, there's something has to be done on, on this front. Mm -hmm. so, I, okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood the question. I thought you were looking for actually being... This type uh, of, so, yeah. 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 Um, hmm, that's an excellent question. I have a couple of people that I'd like to connect you with maybe offline. Yes. So if we can email. Amazing. Yeah, yeah sure. um, some people that have uh, a lot of connections in, in Lebanon actually, but also maybe some suppliers of, of machinery that could be good because there is, um, there's some very high tech solutions that are happening now with companies like Warn Again and Evernew that are doing like chemical recycling of materials. Yeah. But then there's also like more straightforward mechanical recycling. Because um, okay. I think like that the you know the artisanal the lo-fi it's beautiful I love it but it's a it's a very small solution to a big problem. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, Thank please so email much. me and I'll connect you to a couple of people. It would be great. I'll do that. Thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, Carolina, I'm just seeing your question about shoddy. Do you want to clarify what you what you mean by that? Because we didn't talk about shoddy, but I'm glad you brought it up. Hold on, hold on, sorry. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, can you see me? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So it's something that I've always um, was fascinated about as a material that was used in industrial um, manufacturing companies, like in cars or in mattresses and things like that. And um, I feel like there's so many experts already working towards sustainability and circularity and et cetera. And I was like, how else can I solve this problem and maybe use organic, clean shoddy for let's say stuffed animals, you know, I'm putting that out, idea out there for everyone to run with. Um, uh, just wondering like, what would be, is, is there already a company that's focusing on creating more shoddy and how else can we use that instead of a down, for example, yeah. or yeah. things um, like that? It's funny you say this because actually, Dana, whose email I shared from Mara Hoffman, is looking for exactly that. She's Dana and I went to school together. I love her. Uh, that's <laughs> great. She's looking for cool. a, an organic shoddy and mm -hmm. hasn't found one. We were trying to find one together. So for those of you who don't know, shoddy is, 
I guess the best way to describe it is um, if you've seen a moving blanket from a mover, that recycled material that has a little specks of color in it. And it's basically recycled fibers and it's a lot of where our textile waste goes into. It's used for like under carpeting, um, insulation in cars, few different other places. The big problem with it is that you, there's no way to control the feedstock of shoddy and, and what goes into it, mm -hmm. um, the makeup of it. And so a lot of times it's toxic chemicals and harmful yeah, right. processes, dyes and, and surface treatments. You even see little bits of, sh of sequins in there. Um, so you can't export it because it can't be exported outside of the United States if it's made in the United States. A lot of countries won't accept it. I know Canada being one of them won't accept it. Um, mm -hmm. But um you also can't use it for children's uses because because of those chemicals so what, that's what one of those problems, yeah. what's that that's what i was afraid of i was like yeah. no still more problems in this <laughs> yeah so the new denim project are collecting theirs um but they're actually using it for compost for local um uh, coffee growers because it's more valuable there in Guatemala for coffee growing because the small it's the small little fibers that they can't spin Got it. Uh, you know because they'll, they'll, they'll find value in, in spinning the fibers that can be spun and then anything that's too short that can't be spun will, will go to composting um, unfortunately yeah I don't I haven't seen anyone doing any non-synthetic recycled what about um, insulation? you know uh, Madewell has a program where they're collecting back genes and they're turning them into insulation. And I know that they're doing it just from genes. So that, that comes to mind, but I don't know. That still uh, though is still, um, it's still like you can't control the input of that unless it's your own genes. Uh, it. Yeah, so that kind of, it still has the off gassing issues. Uh, okay. yeah. Thank you so much. No problem, um, let me grab that. Anybody else? But if I think of any, if I hear of anybody, Carolina, I will um, send the link to, to Noor to. Oh, thanks, yeah. Gabby, you're faster than me. Yeah, I'm going to put everything in the show notes. All of the uh, sources that Tara mentioned, I will link to when I post the recording. Uh, yes, actually, that is the Circle Earth is that's shoddy. That's a great example of what shoddy looks like. Um, but that's the problem because it is made from old clothes. So you, you don't really know, unless you can control where those clothes come from. So for example, um, while they're not making shoddy, four days is knows exactly what went into their t-shirts because they made them from the fiber level. So they sourced a high quality, long staple organic cotton from Turkey. They knew what dyes went into the yarn and, and into the textiles. Um, they can't control what um, any chemical agents that their customers are using to wash the garments. But you know there are, of course, um, certain industry limitations for those. So there's only so much that, that can be put in. Um, but otherwise, uh, otherwise, they know exactly what went into that. So that's why they can control the, the supply chain. Yeah, the Circle Earth, I believe that's a new company um, and she's using that. And I'm seeing, you know, new applications of that as well. Like that could be like, you know, like the puffer insert in a coat or something. Yeah, um, it, it tends, tends to be quite heavy for puffers though, because it's, okay. it's dense material, unless you're using a very thin layer of it. Yeah. Um, but there's a lot of innovation there in the like recycled down category, as well as um, there's one company, although they're out of Taiwan, so it's a little bit far, uh, that's using coffee grounds and making it into a, um, a polyfill alternative. Um, so that one's interesting. They're collecting coffee grounds from local cafes. Very cool. Yeah. And that's called S Cafe if you're curious to look it up. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions? We're a little bit over the hour now, but I want to make sure that I get to all your questions while you have them. Okay, well, you have my email address. So if you have anything else, oh, sorry, Mary, did you have something? Thank you very much. It was very Thank helpful. You. Oh, I'm glad. Yeah, please feel free to reach out if you have any follow up questions. And if um, anything comes to mind after today, then I will send it on to Noor. Okay, thank you.
Thank you guys so much. And thank you, Tara, for joining our workshop this month. And um, you guys are uh, welcome to sign up for the Textile Tuesdays that Tara is doing now. And um, I will be posting the recording of this on YouTube and on the blog, and I'll be including links to everything we talked about. So thank you guys so much and have a great day. Thank you.